Hey everybody, this is Chris at Torque King, and I want to welcome you to Gear Talk. This is our first ever podcast. Welcome aboard. Hope you enjoy it. Give us a like and subscribe if you do. I've got Jesse with us, our boss and the owner of what we're doing right here. He's going to talk a little bit about what Torque King does, where Torque King came from, and uh, we'll talk back and forth a little bit, and that's that's kind of where we're going to go. Before we get to what Torque King came from and where Torque King's at now, what was your first car? That's a good one. First car or first vehicle? First car, first truck, first vehicle with okay. a motor in it. Well, first vehicle was a 1978 GMC Sierra. I've still got it. Um, Bought it at an auction for $150, of all things, and uh, That's drove it home. That's a good price. Um, That's a really good price if yeah, you drove it home. Yeah, and I haven't really had to put anything into it. It's been sitting a while, and it needs to be all gone through. I was pretty hard on it when I was younger. No. Nah. But uh, no, 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 not me. Um, really, all I did right off to it at first was uh, just change the oils. Um, I put new valve cover gaskets on. Uh, had some smoke when you let off and you know so valve seals were starting to go but <clears throat> the valve cover gaskets fixed it enough it didn't really smoke that much when I let off um, you know they were leaking a little anyway uh, oil pressure sender I think I had to put in it I might have put a starter in it the first year or so I had it and a battery that was about it pretty low maintenance really pretty much I put I don't know, a couple hundred thousand miles on it, boonie bashing and stuff like that. And uh, gas and oil was really all it, all I've got into it. Um, I did have a one side locking hub. The oil got old and hard in it, and it didn't. It started to round off a little bit, but I changed that. Uh, other than that, I haven't put anything into it. I think it was a pretty good investment. I'd say. Actually. 150 bucks for that is a fantastic deal. Yeah, I guess at one point I did, uh, the engine was getting a little weak, and I got a parts truck, a 77, um, that uh, had a 400 small block in it, so I swapped the 350 out for the 400. Now that's starting to, well, last time I drove it, it was starting to get weak too, so I run through that one just as hard. Um, but yeah, it's been been pretty good. So what's the craziest place you ever took that truck? Oh, uh, I don't know. There's there's been a lot of crazy places. I had it up in the um, up in the mountains, several different places. There was there was one spot. It's it's gated off now to public access. But is that your the, fault or is that somebody else? Uh, I don't think it was my fault. I didn't tear anything up, so um, I don't think it was me. But uh, anyway, outside of Red Lodge, there, there's. You can go back and up and back and up. And uh, there's this little trail that hardly ever gets used. I think there's actually some private land at the end of it. Uh, but if you go up in there, there's this very steep hill that you can go up. And I had to put it in four-wheel drive. And I didn't realize how steep it was going up until I turned around and went down. I was standing on the floorboard vertical. <laughs> I don't think those trucks were quite made for that kind of an incline. Maybe um, not, but I remember the first time I was standing on my firewall going yeah, downhill. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it was taking nice. Taking a bite out of the seat at the same time. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah, nice view up there. You can see, uh, you know, all the way past Billings on the plains out here. Uh, it was it was really nice. And then uh, uh, some other trails out in the, uh, what's that mountain range out? Out the Priors. Out by the Priors, nice. some stuff. And out, out by Elk Basin, there's a few challenging areas, not, not too much, but uh, it's, it's had a lot of miles and some, you know, off-highway miles, a lot of dirt road miles. Um, that's mostly where, where it was, was dirt roads, but, you know, sometimes I'd find a Forest Service trail or something and, and take it. Sounds like fun. Mm-hmm. I've done a little of that, not as much actually out off-roading. I had kids pretty young and as much as I wanted to do that stuff. Most of my wheeling was pretty close to home. Yeah. Yeah, I was still, still in high some. school for most of this, too, so it was not too far away, but I'd go up, you know, within 300-mile radius or something. So working on that, I imagine your dad was working on stuff all the time, and so you're oh, using every day. dad's tools and 
dad's advice, getting out, put back together and making it run better. And Yeah, luckily uh, I didn't need too much advice. Uh, gave some pointers on carb rebuilds. You know, I'd regasket them every now and then. Um, set the floats a little bit lower to, so I could, could, could do those inclines without dying out. Uh, but, yeah, any time I had to really do anything to it, um, yeah, his tools were right there. Awful handy. you got plenty of your own now, I know. Oh, man, yeah. It's amazing how much you can rack up in tool sales. Yeah, yeah. i got a garage full now. I don't know what to do with half of them, but at least I can do just about anything I want. I need to. Right on. So, wheeling around in that truck high school and then you get out of high school and then uh, join the Marines? I did, yeah. I did a few years there. Um, that old truck was parked. That was the last time I drove it actually. I came home home on leave one time, uh, maybe my second year in and drove it. And that's been 12 years ago, 13 years ago or something now, maybe more. Um, last time that truck drove, but uh, yeah, did that for four years. A couple new carb gaskets and you'll be back on the road with it. I yeah, think. needs a center bearing. I pulled the center bearing out of the re rear drive shaft. It, uh, it seized up, so it just stripped all the rubber out of it. But I drove it home, you know. <laughs> it was, you know, had to get home, so I drove it home real slow. Oh, I know how that sounds. Yeah. Um, so after that, it's been parked. Yeah, before they started putting ethanol in fuel. So Right. At least the fuel that's in there turned turned to varnish. It doesn't have the negative effects of mm. ethanol. At least it doesn't eat up all the O-rings. So. Yeah, yeah. Through the process, you worked on that a little bit. You went into the, the Marines. What did you do in the Marines? Were you uh, in the motor pool? Did you play around with other stuff? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> my MOS was uh, 3531, which is essentially a truck driver. Um, but I did a lot of maintenance there. Um, and a lot of driving. Um, did some other stuff on the side as needed, you know, wherever they, they needed me to do, I guess. But uh, mostly fa focused on the trucks. Right on. So what's the craziest stuck you ever got a military vehicle? Can you even talk about it? <clears throat> uh, well, there's there's been a couple, but uh, luckily none of them were me. Um, a lot of the guys, they weren't uh, truck drivers, but they had trucks, just our unit, everything was mobilized. And so, you know, comm guys had their, communications guys had their trucks. There was, um, you know, the art artillery guys had their trucks. Uh, a lot of them were our trucks that they used for hauling the ammunition and stuff. And they didn't know really how to drive a lot of them. That doesn't uh, surprise no. me. No. Um, some of them, the, the Humvees went through this. <clears throat> it looked okay. It ended up being really wet, just a kind of a low spot. And then they had a, one of them stu newer Stuart and Stevenson five tons, and they just sunk it right to the axles. And they they just buried themselves in. They didn't know how to really lock lock the diffs up to go. They By the time they figured it out, they were already buried um, all the way up to the axles. And I had an Oshkosh 7-ton I was driving in the back with all the spare tires and recovery equipment and stuff like that. Um, I didn't have a, a wrecker, but just, you know, just the stuff we needed for a couple days out. Yeah. And uh, so they called me up on the radio, and I drive up and see what they're getting into. And uh, I threw them a nice big chain and told them to hook it together, and I went and aired down the tires. So they got the push-button air up, air down, and all that. Yeah. And uh, locked locked everything up to make sure all all six tires turned. And uh, guy out my door, you know, I told him, let me know when they're ready. He said they're ready. And so I started giving him a little tug, and I, you know, I'm just burning all six. And I'm thinking, what the heck? You know, this thing will pull out a tank just about. What's going on here? So I'm going, going, back up a little bit, give it just a little tug. You know, it's on a chain, so I don't know rip it too hard but just right. just to give it a little something and uh i look in my mirror i see their tires aren't turning and the guy's standing out next to the truck with the door open <laughs> well okay uh, thanks you know. for all the help buddy so 
I get out on the step and yell at him to get in the truck. And so he gets in the, in the truck. And I start going, start going. Well, the tires still aren't moving. He's got the parking brakes still on. So, genius, uh, so, genius individual. Yeah. So I went back there and we had a nice little conversation and uh, got back in my truck. And by that time, he had it in reverse. And I pulled him, pulled him right out. Man, the nastiest stuck I ever saw a truck. Uh, I had a cement pump down in Wyoming. Peter built with a long trailer. Uh, it's not super long trailer, but a heavy trailer. It's about a hundred and uh, I think we were one hundred eighty thousand. No, I can't be right. One hundred thirty thousand though. Yeah, very heavy. A lot of iron on the thing, right? Plus the iron we add on the also all the piping that we pump through. So we've got this cement pump down in uh, Wamsutter, Wyoming, and. It was a dry day, as dry as any other, and we went out to do just a little work over work, uh, an old well. So everything that was there when they were drilling it is gone. It's just dirt, wellhead in the middle of a location. We get there to pump, and they told us where they wanted to back up the truck. And I had a fellow supervisor trainee with me, and he was scouting around looking around where he could pull the truck forward to get it backed up right, checking everything out. And he said he walked out on this dirt because it didn't look good, but it felt dry. He put his hands on it and it felt dry. He said, ah, it's probably just a little soft. Pulls the truck that way, and as soon as the truck went over it, it had to be where the old pit was because they hadn't packed it, that trunk immediately sunk deep in and he tried to keep on going forward to get some momentum and move through it no such luck got the whole tractor into the dirt so it was like i said just dry as a bone but that truck sunk immediately to the rims so the tires are completely in the dirt and the longer it sat there the deeper it got those are my favorite and within about 45 minutes the frame was sitting on the dirt and sinking in, dry. Then, and never mind, we're trying to pull it out the whole time, right? We have these hooks on the back of there. I'm sure you've seen them on the back of the military trucks, same kind of stuff. Great big hook right on the back of the frame. Yeah. We put a big heavy strap on there, tried to pull it back with the bulk truck, bent the hook out, mm. tried again, sliced the strap, Read it with a chain, broke a chain. I said, okay guys, we're gonna go ahead and have somebody who's better at this take it out. So we called a, a wrecker to come and pull it out. Meanwhile, we rigged it up from where it was. We had enough iron, we could make the pump from where it was. It was just a lot more work to get rigged up. Some of my guys were thrilled. So we get that all rigged up, pump the job. The wrecker finally shows up and it took him 45 minutes to an hour after he rigged up just to winch that truck back out of there. Dry as a bone. We're stuck ever. <laughs> In dry dirt. In dry dirt. That's the best kind. Well, it was dry. It was dry all the way up until we were pulling it out, and then it started to rain and got slippery. Mm. Then it actually was probably easier to pull it out. But Greased it up a little. Oh, man, that was a mess. Yeah, we had some of that uh, overseas. Nice, fine talcum powder moon dust. And there was some soft spots that got traveled frequently. Yep. And you didn't want to take a humpy through there because they got they were ended up being too low. They'd sink right to the belly band. Oh wow! Can't get anywhere when you're high centered. No, no. So, back up a little bit further. Then, what was the first time you were curious about motors, vehicles, engines, any of that? Uh, that's a good question. I don't even know. It's just something I always grew up around. I yeah. mean, I was maintaining and operating farm equipment from, you know, the earliest since, memories. Yeah, earliest memories, sitting on my dad's lap at like six on a tractor and all by myself by eight or nine or so. I'm um, the same way. I didn't get to run as much equipment. Uh, I had allergies that kicked my butt mm. back then, but I was always on an engine. I'd take the lawnmower 
and go just drive it around the farm. Yeah. Actually, when I was, That's I forgot all, all about do, that. Drive. When I was, oh, very young, six or seven, we had this old Craftsman lawnmower. I think we even got that secondhand, so it was old when we got it. And uh, we upgraded to uh, something different, I guess. And that became mine. I built a little roll bar for it, put some lights on it. <laughs> uh, I never did get to re-gear it. I put <coughs> uh, traction tires on it. Um, yeah, we'd throw it into neutral and go down the hill out there where, right where I grew up and get up to like 20, 25 miles an hour on a little one more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've uh, seen some guys doing that uh, in some YouTube videos in the last year or so that are doing just crazy speeds on lawn tractors. Yeah. I was always going to re-pulley it, and I never did. And I think that thing finally got scrapped, probably while I was in the military. But yeah. Yeah, that was a fun little toy that I got to mess with. Uh, you know, right around the same time I was messing with agricultural equipment because we didn't have anything new back then so it was all you know keep this hundred year old stuff moving yeah so uh, yeah it's just always been something I've done uh, right up till I enlisted and then even while I was enlisted I still even though it wasn't uh, the my job per se we had enough uh, mechanics that didn't know enough so I ended up working on stuff all through there and then you know got out and still working on stuff it made me think of that Ron Swanson clip in Home Depot and the gas and figuring out he says I know more than you <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah there was there was many times where you know out on an island had to change a brake cage on a on a on a truck because it blew a hole in the diaphragm and the one that we had uh, the threads weren't right or something, or they weren't tapped all the way. I couldn't get it started. You know, we went out there with basically no tools. And, of course, the mechanic we had with us didn't even want to tackle a brake job. Um, but I ended up being able to rob enough pieces that the thing wouldn't work, but uh, I was able to hook the lines to it just so they were plugged because we didn't even have caps for, you know, plug <laughs> airlines off. Right. And uh, I ended up just zip tying it to the frame. You know, we were on our way um, back out of there anyway. And um, yeah, stuff that nobody wanted to touch. I had to take one brake can apart to rob parts to put in another one just to get it to seal. It wasn't perfect, but it'd keep the truck with enough air pressure to get down to the beachhead and get back on one of the landing crafts. And, you know, that was probably my first time that um, mechanics that I worked with didn't really know what they were doing. Yeah. And then there was plenty of times overseas where we had a generator go out or something, and we had one good mechanic with us. And uh, another one that was okay with some things, but not other things. But one generator, we uh, the thermostat ended up going out on it, so we took the lock washers to space it open uh, part <laughs> way. So it's still kind of stay, you know, right. stay warm, so it wasn't around cold all the time. but. Um, did that, and then there was another couple smaller generators that um, one had a bad engine, one had a bad generator, so we did the old switcheroozy. Uh, Make one out of two. Yeah, and then there was uh, a bigger cat generator that had a C7 in it that, um, yeah, we had to do a bunch of stuff to get that to work too because we didn't have computers to diag you know, for diagnostic stuff right. or nothing. Uh, and those little LCD displays don't really tell you anything but a code. And uh, yeah, there was some there was some jumping wires and stuff figuring that out just to so we had power in our tents when we got back. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of figuring stuff out, which I you know did before that. And shoot, I'm still doing that kind of stuff. You know, figuring out what to do to make something work. And, yeah, I talked to a buddy of mine a few years ago about that. I said, Mark, do you think you think this is more of a, a blessing or a curse to have mechanical aptitude? And he immediately said, it's a curse. It is absolutely <laughs> a curse. He said, I wish I didn't know anything at all about mechanical things. I wish I just had a regular job and I'd just pay a mechanic to fix stuff. For me yeah, well. Instead of being a mechanic. <clears throat> there's two sides to that. It depends on where you take your stuff. Sometimes you just can't pay for nothing anymore, you know. Mm -hmm. You're better off doing it yourself, but. 
yeah, when you know how to do stuff, everybody's always asking you to help fix something or do this or do that. No, well, I know I caught him on a bad day that day. <laughs> He's still working as a mechanic. <laughs> it's not an accident. He's still doing what he knows how to do. Yeah. And he's making good money at it. Yeah. It's a good thing to know how to do. It's definitely uh, cheaper if you can fix your own stuff. That's for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've saved myself hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. by fixing it myself. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe not quite that much, but an awful lot. You'd be surprised. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Parts these days are getting crazy expensive. They are. They are. And labor rates are going up, too. Yeah, and, uh, you know, rates are going to go up for, for labor. I mean, people have got to get paid a livable wage to do what they're doing. I don't have a problem with that. But I do have a problem with somebody charging an arm and three legs and nine cows and still not getting the job done. Right, right. right. Not a whole lot of patience for that. I think that's part of why I like being here so much. The, the stuff that you guys offered before I ever got here, uh, I find out stuff every day that's here that I didn't even know about, didn't know it was here. More stuff that's made, more stuff that's going to get made. I'm glad to be part of making some of the new stuff. Um, how did you end up starting to to make parts instead of just buy parts? Well, the demand has always been there for stuff back to... I mean, there's demand back to older stuff for the 40s and 50s and even 60s, but back to the 70s even, there's still, how many 70s trucks are still on the road? All, you know, all the ones that didn't get crushed, really. Right. You know, mine would still be on the road if I had time to fix it. It doesn't need much, you know, but... Yeah, I'd still have my 78 Jimmy going if somebody hadn't stole it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I hope that didn't get crushed. I hope whoever <laughs> stole it actually gets to use it. Uh, but there's always been a, a demand for this stuff. And, you know, growing up, you know, we didn't have a lot of extra. All of our equipment and vehicles was older stuff. And, uh, you know, you had to keep it going. And that's still the way, you know, most people, but most people aren't made of money. Right. They can't, you know, they got to keep their old stuff going. And we are in a unique position where we had this experience with the parts and we know what's what. Um, so we just started... You know, first we started making tools so people could service stuff themselves. And then when parts started getting hard to find, well, we'd find out what parts are still, uh, you know, viable to make and still, you know, worth making, that, you know, like there's some kind of demand for them. Right. Um, like the 97F250 hub. Yeah, um, 97F250 hub. <clears throat> uh, let's see, the first, the fr I think the first parts we started making were probably... Um, well, it was actually the MV4500 uh, fifth gear fix that we started with. Yeah. And somewhere along the line, uh, 205 gaskets, uh, you know, a lot of those are specific thicknesses. There's always been aftermarket uh, availability for that, right. but they're never, they're always, you know, thin gaskets. Right. They don't get your bearing spacing correct and all that. So it went into some gasket stuff. And I remember buying gaskets for something like that years ago and the guy at the parts counter said you need two he says mm -hmm. i know it only says one take two it won't be thick enough mm -hmm. well at least he knew what he was doing yeah he, well, he, was, he, he worked with what he had um you know it just kind of just kind of went from there i guess before we knew it, we were doing shims and you know other gaskets and uh then we started doing uh parts i don't know what our first parts were that we started making besides the MB4500 stuff. Um, drive shafts, I guess, making drive shafts, but uh, uh, actual components like, like this, um, uh, kingpin bushings, I think, was probably at the top of the list for some of the older closed knuckle trucks. Um, I know like that Ford you were just talking about, the uh, for the automatic hubs, that little lock wedge. Um, that that go that holds your spindle nut right. from backing off. Uh, I actually designed that to be better than the Ford one. Uh, the Ford one, you put it in there and it still kind of shakes around a little bit. But I uh, adjusted some stuff on the angles and now it's actually a better part than factory. Better, better fit. Yeah, and that's been five years anyway since we made that. Uh, I know there was some other parts in between there that we started making, but I can't think of what they were. 
Uh, and then just recently, you know, wheel hubs started making those for the Ford and then some of the Dodge rears. Um, there's all, I'd have to print a list out of all the stuff we make. Locking yeah. hub dials uh, for the old Spicer hubs that are no longer available. Right. Um, there's a few guys every week that call up and want some parts for that. Yeah. I just saw out front today some of the parts for that left today. Yeah. To an in-store guy, yeah. Um, I also came up with a kit for the old uh, worn M2 hubs, which fit. Some of the parts are the same for M1 and uh, some other variations of the early worn hubs. I've come up with a, a kit for those. Uh, and the little pins that they take, because everything was held in with pins, I right. come up with the, the right pin stock material for it and cut to the right length and all kinds of stuff to keep these old trucks going. So if the first part you got making, you started making, was the that fifth gear fix for the NV4500, when you first decided to, I mean, I know everybody thinks about, man, somebody ought to build something better for this. So you came up with an idea. What 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 prompted you to actually put it in, go for it, and actually make it? That's probably a question for my dad. He, yeah. he started all this. Um, he probably just saw a consistency of failures, and he just came up with a fix for it. I'd like to ask him about that because what, my experience when somebody's got uh, a new business idea, there's. I mean, you talk to anybody about something long enough, they'll come up with a, somebody should make this, right? You know, you hear that just about anywhere you go. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the people that actually produce something and put it out there for the market, uh, some of those people just figured that was what it was going to be. They started making it, and that's as far as they thought about it. They just figured they'd go ahead and make it. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are nervous about it, afraid, what if I have to make too many? I wonder if that, that ever crosses your mind. Uh, I'm sure it crossed his mind back then, and, you know, it crosses my mind now. Um, you know, to, to make something, you do have to make so many so that it's, the, the price balances out. You know, right. if you get, like for these hubs, for instance, um, you know, I, can, I have to buy this bar in a whole, a whole bar. Right. And, you know, that's not cheap. Um, and, sure, I can cut and make one hub. Not too cheap, but I'm still left over with the cost for the rest right. of the bar. So then I'm putting more time into making the whole bar into hubs. And then I've got basically all this stuff that the material is already transformed into something. I can't take that back, but I don't have anything else I can use it for. Right. And now I've got all the time invested in, in this. So, yeah, there is definitely a thought anytime you make something new. Uh, you know, what's what's the, you know, it all comes back to the demand. Is it a one-off? If it's a one-off, it just depends on what it is. Um, but in most cases, it's, uh, yeah, okay, there's some demand there. Let's make the minimal amount that we can and just test the waters, see right. if it sells. And there's, you know, there's plenty of stuff sitting on the shelf that we've, um, you know, it sounded like, you know, a few people needed it. We sold a couple, but we still got a bunch left. Uh, you know, it's it's bound to happen, but right. you just got to kind of pick and choose where where you're doing that. And with these older vehicles, it's getting kind of hard because you know a lot of them are just rusted away or, you know, going away, right. not worth fixing at all. Um, but there is still, you know, there's still a ton out there, but is this, is that part really a high demand part? Like a wheel hub, well, for some applications, apparently it is like the Ford ones. I don't know how many thousands of those we've made so far in the last couple of years. Uh, they're going out. They're going out almost every day. Uh, you know, is it, and that's a hard part. That's usually not something that people change. Right. Um, you know, like a gasket or something, anytime that they do a rebuild gasket. Right. Um, you know, anytime you do wheel bearings, usually it's not a hub unless it's generally speaking, 80 no. to 97 F250, F350 for yeah. some reason. Yeah, for whatever reason, there's a whole lot of those that just uh, just are failing on guys. Yeah. Don't know what it is. Um, I think I, I come up with uh, the wall just doesn't hold up. Uh, you know, the weight of the vehicle always pressing uh, pressing up when you when you're turning. Um, it just 
I guess maybe not enough work uh, work work expands enough, it. Not enough maintenance. People should probably grease those bearings more often. Um, more I think often. for the most part they're greased. Uh, it's just the the material just gets worked and it just expands. Right. So I know the the hubs that we make, right? They're a nodular iron like an old heavy duty racing mm -hmm. block engine. They're tougher stuff than what was original. They are, and they're slightly heavier where we could put a little bit extra material. Um, they're, there's a lot better material getting cast into it. than Yeah, and, and adding weight to it, uh, adding thickness, I know that's a, that's a tricky business too because it is. you think that maybe you can add a little bit to a fillet in here, and then as soon as you put it on the truck, you've got something that has to have that space. So yes. That's not exactly a simple process. No, uh, every time you you design something, and you want to make it better. You really gotta really gotta pay attention to where you're adding material or changing an angle or something like that. Uh, I got a 3D printer actually, so we can start 3D printing stuff, which we've been you right. designed some stuff up for us uh, just to make sure that we don't run into anything. You can measure all day and you know test fit in your head all you want, but until you got a you know, something you can physically do. It does you make might it does not help quite it. a bit. It makes a pretty big difference to be able to put a physical part in place and see what it does. Mm -hmm. And you've seen it with uh, gaskets and stuff. Um, you know, you think you got the holes, you know, you, you do all your measuring, you spend a half a day just measuring holes and you put it, you know, you get your, get it all sketched up, but you go to th 3D print it or, you know, make it, right. whether it's production or 3D prototype and, uh, the, a hole's off by half a hole or something somehow. Yeah, yeah. I measured up on those holes for that transfer case adapter for hours mm -hmm. and got it all put in there and still could have used a smidge more one way or another mm -hmm. until I finally got it right. It's yeah. pretty close now. But I got that 3D printer and it cuts a lot of the guesswork out. Some of that yeah, stuff, does. you know, we have to outsource and a lot of these places don't really send you a sample. You know, how many do you right. want? You want a thousand? You want two thousand? You want ten thousand? Kind of well, got to be right the first time. Yeah, it's got to be right the first time. Um, so prototyping really, you know, goes in a lot. And there's there are people out there that um, they're just swift in a mechanical engineering sense that they can just nail it the first time every time. Right. Those people are pretty rare. And you know, I we're doing pretty good. We're getting it pretty close. But a three D print to make sure just to dot the I's and cross the T's. Absolutely. Uh, is, you know, I have no problem doing that, buying 3D filament just to make sure that we'll, what we did is It's a whole lot cheaper right. than steel. It is. It's a whole lot cheaper than steel or gasket paper if it's a gasket. Yeah. Um, and there's been, you know, then, then you don't have to worry so much about uh, when the first batch comes in. You still got to check it, but you don't have to sit there with a magnifying glass and look at every single little detail. Right. You know, it's more of just a final verification. Yep, that fits. That does everything that we 3D printed and we found the issues. We fixed those. This is this part's good to go. So for us, it's definitely um, helped a lot. So we've talked a little bit about the products that you built over time, and your dad started. King. When did he decide to, to go from, start actually what, quad 4x4 four four, or was there something before that? Well, it was, that's kind of an interesting story. He's probably a better one to tell that, but I can brief you on the highlights. Okay, cliff notes. Yeah, the cliff notes. Um, back in the late 70s, him and his brother started quad off-road uh, outside of Buffalo, New York, years ago, 70s, late 70s. And that went for, I don't know how long, into the 80s somewhere. And then shortly after I was born, they moved up to northern Montana. Um, they were there until they found the place that they wanted to be, which is where I grew up, outside of Roberts there. He was doing the farming thing, and neighbors needed their trucks fixed, and he still had his old tools and stuff. So one thing led to another, and, you know, fixing, fixing neighbors' vehicles all the time, and I don't know how it came about exactly, but all of a sudden when the NB4500 came out, there was failures with that. Uh, and that was, we started, uh, he called it quad 4x4, that was in the early 90s. 
Uh, then the NV4500 stuff came out, and he came up with the fix for that. And before you know it, we're, we're national. You know, we've got people bringing their trucks from Florida and Maine and Alaska, and you know, most of them were, well, not most of them, a lot of them were hotshot guys, you know, so they dropped their 30 to 40 foot right. goosenecks off right in front of the house there. And a lot of them were just guys that wanted their truck fixed, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, some guys shipped us their truck, some guys brought it, and then we shipped it back. Some shipped it up, and then they drove it back. And um, so he did that all through most of the 90s and uh, the early 2000s. Um, we made our first website, I think, in 99. Uh, and it had the parts for the MV4500 stuff. It wasn't, I don't believe it was an e-commerce site at that time. I think it was more of just a information site. Kind of an advertisement. Yeah, an advertisement. Um, and then if people wanted parts shipped to them, you know, they just call in. And we took their order over the phone and typed it into a credit card machine. Um, yeah. That was, yeah, when we did that, that's when we went from the carbon copy swiper to uh, a dial-up. Um, you know, little right. credit card machines. Machine. Credit card machines. Um, and speaking of dial-up, all the stuff was made. All we had out there was a dial-up connection, and it was not very fast. Yeah. Uh, so our first website, all the way up to you know, all of our website stuff up to when we moved to Billings in 2015, it was all dial-up um, for for doing all that. But uh, anyway, we you know we went from 99 or thereabouts. Um, into shortly after I, I went into the service, um, he wanted to quit actually working on vehicles. So it was 100% online sales in about, oh, seven, oh, eight, somewhere in there. Maybe yeah. it was somewhere in there. And, uh, you know, he'd occasionally take, uh, for a short well, he'd occasionally take a, or a, a neighbor's vehicle in or something to work on it. But pretty quickly, the uh, the shop bay got filled up with shelves. And, uh, you know, we didn't, it was only a couple thousand square foot, something like that, all together of, of parts storage. Um, and then, oh, it was around the same time he quit working on stuff. He changed the name from, well, we, we went incorporated. We were an LLP before then, then incorporated. And then um, we moved to Billings in 2015. We needed more space, so we moved into a 5,000-ish square foot warehouse. We thought, oh, God, we're never going to fill this up. You know, it's three times more space than we ever had. Um, well, pretty quickly we filled that up. Uh, but anyway, in about 2016-ish, we changed the name from Quad 4x4 to Torque King 4x4. Uh, Torque King was our pre was our uh, that was our brand for the fifth gear fix. Right. Torque King fifth gear fix. Um, still famous so on a lot of still blogs. famous. We still get people calling in for it. Yeah. Um, and we needed to change the name because all of a sudden quads were kind of a big name for ATVs. Right. Um, you know, where back when we come up with the name, the, you had three wheelers, you know. Right. Um, the Honda and y uh, Yamaha probably had, you know, that was that, three wheelers, and I don't know, I'd probably, people probably just call them death traps or something, you know. They didn't yeah. call them anything High but speed that. death traps, yeah. that's for sure. Um, so, you know, it wasn't an issue in, until about 2016, and then all of a sudden it just seemed like it was a huge issue. People calling in for four wheeler parts. So well, I don't have anything like that. So we changed the name to Torque King, uh, and we've been rolling with that since. In 2020, I think, yep, 2020, we started looking for a bigger warehouse because we were out of space in a 5,000 square foot one. And then, you know, it took us a while, but we finally came up with where we are now. We got um, this main building's 25,000 square foot, not all of it's finished yet. Right. Uh, but it, it is actively, all of it's actively used for part storage. Right. Plus we've got square footage And outside. filling up since and, I've been here and in filling up. a few short months. Yeah, we moved into here just the part that's finished. We thought, oh, man, you know, same thing as 2015. We're never going to fill this up. And we're already, you know, we started tripping over stuff already, but we reorganized some stuff and we're, we're getting there. Um, so how many orders do you think you shipped last year, do you know? Oh, God. I I don't know. I mean, we're not a huge company but 
maybe close to thirty thousand, something like that. That's that sounds like a lot of orders to me. It's it's a yeah, it's a lot. Going from a mom and pop shop that, you know, it's just my folks, right? Talking, you know, dad talking on the phone, my mom putting stuff in boxes, to well, it looks like that kind of growth is exponential. It is. It is, uh, especially when you start. Making right. parts that are... When you make parts that the guy calls up and says, man, this is the only place in the universe I can find this. Yeah. Well, He's not wrong. How many times have you heard that in a week? Uh, at least a dozen times in a week. I do. Uh, whether it's with these Dodge Dually hubs or the Ford hubs for the front end. And I know we got the hubs for the, the Chevy and, and the Dodges as well for those old Dana 60s. And mm-hmm. uh, I, like I said, I keep finding more parts that we have here that are made... Uh, right here, uh, and so much of it right here in Montana. How many how many places make something for Torque King exclusively? Um, I think you said your vendor list was getting to be a pretty long page. It's a pretty long page, yeah. Uh, we do have, you know, we make some stuff in-house, and we do have, uh, there's a local machine shop here that, you know, they make other stuff, but nothing really automotive. Right. So they make... All our automotive stuff is for us. Uh, there's a place that makes gaskets, um, and they make them for other heavy-duty automotive stuff. But you know, we're the we're their only light-duty customer. Um, there is our Ford hubs that we're making. You know, we don't have a forge and all that right. here to make that. So those are exclusive um, to us. Uh, there's a there's a few other parts like that that are exclusive to us, but we what we try to do is find the people that are specialized for that particular part, whether it's a you know a hub or a brass bushing or something, right, um, or a gasket. Finding the best people to do the best work. Yeah, there's there's a lot of shops that could do everything, but because they're not really specialized, it does drive the cost up. And right. uh, you know the parts cost what they cost, but I do want it done. So that it's reasonable for the customer, right? And none of our stuff is that we, that we make is imported either, right? Um, you know, we we we've got the opportunity. I mean, I I could sell this uh, Dodge rear hub for probably a quarter of what it takes just to make it here, right? But um, there's already a ton of you know, you go to any of your parts chain stores, they've already got Chinese crap, and maybe not these particular things, but they've already got the Chinese crap and. Um, I just, we just don't want any, any, any no. part of that. No, garbage. I understand. I'm, I feel the same way. And so do most of the people that call in. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's several people that don't really care where it comes from as long as it's quality. Mm-hmm. And I don't have a problem with that either. But when we've got the yeah. opportunity to employ people here, even close by here, and make a product that you just can't get anymore, I, I'm excited to be part of it. I'm, I'm glad to be part of it. So, to me, that that really is the essence of twerking mm-hmm. is uh, keeping that rig on the road. And yeah. I know I've said it in a few videos. If people haven't seen it yet, we've got a bunch of them. Have a look. Mm-hmm. But uh, keeping the rig on the road is something that that was always near and dear to me. Much like you driving old stuff, driving old tractors, keeping stuff going. We understand that. Not just kind of. It's deep into the bones. Yeah. And. Being able to keep stuff going, uh, being able to find the parts, and you know everything's expensive this, these days. Everything is. Everything's going up. Steel's going up. Labor's going up. But it's still cheaper to keep something on the road that's 20 years old than to buy a brand new pickup. I mean, by far, I've seen pickups at 120 thousand dollars these days. Yes. Yep. That is an I, awful lot. Of I money. test drove one of those. Um, at four fifties, that was. I won't even do it. I was just want it real. It was bad. back in twenty. This was back <laughs> in twenty seventeen when the cave just came out. It was still, uh, you know, it wasn't even in production yet. You could pre order it, but they they had a few trucks made that they went around the country. Yeah. And people got to test drive them, and they're nice. Boy, it was sure you know progressive steering and stuff. That was sure interesting, but uh, yeah, I I don't know about you, but I don't have that kind of money. I don't um, have that kind of money. So, yeah, I, I mean, I've never been able to afford any of that. I mean, nowadays, nobody can o- even afford a half-ton anymore, it seems like. Right. They want fifty grand for a half-ton truck. It, it's just ridiculous. Um, so, it, you know, we've always tried to keep the old trucks going. 
and part costs are going up, but I mean, any more you can, it doesn't matter how old the vehicle is. If it's still in decent shape and it just needs kind of gone through here and there, you can still put, I mean, you can even highball it and redo everything for say 15,000. I mean, that's right. if, so you took the motor out, you know, did oh, yeah. that, you did everything. Uh, maybe some interior work, you know, a lot of this is doing it yourself. Right. Labor rates, it wouldn't be at 15,000, but right. um, you can put $15,000 into an old truck and still be 10 times better than buying something brand new off the lot. You got Absolutely. less upfront cost. You know, you can, most people are able, you know, usually not everything fails at the same time. So you can put all that in and say a year time. if you just want to freshen it up or a couple right. of years. Um, you know, it's less than even the interest on your your mortgage payment for a new truck. Right. Uh, new trucks with all the electronic garbage, sure, it's nice and fancy and heated seats here and heated steering wheel, all this. Oh, yeah. I like that stuff, but, too. You know, like that old 78 that I still have, and I really didn't put in anything into it, and I drove it a lot, and I was hard on it. I could not do that with anything new. No. I Every year I'd have to do something to it, something no. major. And, you know, you hear arguments one way or the other. Part of the, probably one of the biggest arguments my brothers and myself have talked about is planned obsolescence. Talked about that with my grandfather mm -hmm. and my father and planned obsolescence. If you don't plan for the part to eventually fail, then you can't sell the part again. That's I get right. that. It makes sense business-wise, but these hubs aren't something that somebody's <clears throat> going to have to buy a second no, time for that our, truck. No. But they no. might have another truck they'll need to let sell right. for. The way I like to do business is I sell, it, sell the person the parts that they need, and I never want to hear about that particular part again. You know, right. They shouldn't be coming back for warranties. Occasionally you get a warranty on some, it ha it's gonna happen. Right. But you don't want them coming back every other, even six months if you're right. getting ball drinks or something from the chain store. I mean, I tried it once, I got 15,000 miles out of them compared to 120 right. out of the OE ones. You know? Right. Um, you know, when, I, when a guy gets parts, I don't wanna talk to that guy again about that component until it's at its rebuild interval again. Right. You know, like a transfer case. So you get a hundred, two hundred thousand miles, you know, whatever whatever the guy gets out of it. Right. I don't wanna I don't want to hear from him again. Where well, yeah, these hubs we should be hundred and fifty thousand miles oh, before they need bearings again. Before they need bearings, yeah. Um at least, yeah. Um and with vehicle manufacturers these days, well you look back in the old days, old Chevy, Dodge and Ford, you know, their axle parts and a lot of their transfer case parts, depending on the transfer case it was, a lot of that was interchangeable between all three for 30 years. Yeah. And now you got a major component change every three or four years. Right. And Well, like my they, 10 Dodge, the, those knuckles for the front of that three-quarter ton. Oh, yeah, they're they gone. They stopped making them. They're gone. They're 12 years, old. It's 12, year old, 12 years old now? Yeah. Yeah, but that's got me a little bit panicked. It's, it's gone. That's yeah. something I'm working on. And I hope to be making those <laughs> in the near future. Yeah. It's, it's just ridiculous. Um, I mean, unfortunately, the demand that's being created by all these manufacturers isn't something that we're going to be able to keep up with, at least immediately, because that's, you know, you're talking in the last decade, you know, say the last 20 years, really, they yeah. start, they've been doing that now. Um, changing something on, on a vehicle every three or four years for each make, that's... I don't know who's going to be able to keep up with that. We're sure going to try, but... Right. Um, well, a prime example of that is the NB4500. Running from 92 to all the way to 2007 for Chevy. 2003, I think, was the last Dodge. Uh, no, it was it was later five? than that. Yeah, five, five, I think, oh, five. That's a lot of years. And between two makers, that's a lot of transmissions. Yeah, plus uh, whatever truck chassis, some of them were, right. you know, like delivery truck. Yeah, and um, Chevy, I'm sure put them in, 30, in the 4500s and 5500s mm -hmm. for a while as well. Yep. So quite a few different vehicles that those went into. And because there's so many of them made, there was bound to be an aftermarket that would pick up and, and, and make parts. And we have a lot of those aftermarket parts now. We do. Yeah. Um, the 5600 right after it runs for that short little period of time. Yeah, that's a little, that's a little tougher. The early ones or even harder with some of that synchronizer stuff. But, um, yeah, it's just really unfortunate when there's only, 
uh, you know, maybe a five year life cycle on these, right. you know, or, you know, production cycle on these parts. And some of them, uh, like in Dodge, what was it, 08, 09, I think, where they did the knuckle change, there's one year of that. Yeah. And the 0002 Dodge, there was one year for that axle, but only a half a year of the non CAD axle. You know, yes, yeah. makes for some interesting parts picking, finding stuff. Yeah. So. You know, it's no surprise if somebody goes to the parts store with Jimmy the kid there working that's just working after school and hasn't got a clue on what the parts are. People get very frustrated with parts stores. And that even happens here sometimes. I mean, we try the best we can, but I think our salespeople we've got going right now are pretty careful about they're, getting the right part. They're pretty careful. I think most of the problem now is customers don't really know what they have. <laughs> I've got that. Uh, Far you know, too many so times. Hey, they, what have I got? I don't know. You tell me. Yeah. Well, it's either that or, say, on an old closed knuckle, do they have the Dana 44 or the Dana 60? Well, right. they think it's a Dana 60 because it's the 12-bolt, or they don't know it's 12 versus 8-bolt knuckle seal, so they think they got the heavier duty. Right. Really, they got the lighter duty. They hear 8-bolt, and they think it's an 8-lug. Yeah. 8-lug and think it's an 8-bolt. Yeah. Um, or they think just because it's a three-quarter ton truck or something, it's got the heavier parts. Not always the case in oh, some of that older case. stuff. Or maybe it did come factor with that older stuff, but somewhere down the line, somebody had to have that heavier axle and they had a truck they could swap. And so they did the old switcheroo and I've done those sold swaps. it. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, no that's shame. the reason. I'm not ashamed for one second. I've done it. It, it had to be done. Got to get back in the field and yeah. make, it, make it move. Yep. Yeah. Um, I know that's that's one big issue. Uh, I can't speak for the chain stores. You're lucky if you get a guy that even knows how to use the computer to look something up on their, on yep. their website, you know. But uh, here, yeah, I, I think the team we got up front is pretty good at at determining, you know, getting asking the right questions to determine what the customer has. Right. And in most cases, it's, um, you know, from what I've seen, it's very rarely what's sold by the sales team. It's more what the customer orders online because they think they have something right. different. And well, I'd say up. if you're a customer calling in, give us the best help you can. Find out as much as you can before you call us. But if you really don't even know where to look, give us a call. We'll help you anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pictures. We've had a lot of guys send pictures, um, you know, either text or email, and we've been able to t determine 99.5% uh, of helpful. what they what they needed. And our exploded views. When I first found those selling, I didn't even realize what I had available right there until I started looking through it. And I'm looking at our exploded views, and I can see a part number listed. You know, we just have them listed 1 through 12 or whatever on the page, but when I can have a customer looking on their computer at the exact same part, we don't even begin to wonder if it's the same part. That's right. It's exactly the right part. Yeah, they, they might not know what something's called, and maybe you say it and it doesn't ring a bell for them or something. It, it happens. You don't have to know what each part's called. Oh, as right. long as you can I need look a at a trunnion picture. trunnion bearing. Yeah. It's a trunnion bearing. <laughs> as long I know as, a lot of people yeah. use that term, but we don't have it listed that way because no. that's not what the factory listed it as. We have it listed by factory part names. So uh, trunnion bearing, it's the bearing in the, in the kingpin front end. In this case that I'm talking about. In this about, case. Who knows what it is. The next guy says, I need a trunnion bearing. It's a bearing in the trunnion. You know. Yeah, of course. <laughs> on my table saw where I've got a trunnion under the table. Yes, yeah. That's, that's the trunnion to me. Yeah, there you go. Um, but yeah, the exploded views, we're coming out with them as fast as we can for as many applications as we can because it's easier for somebody to look at a picture and see how the stuff comes apart and say, oh, yeah, that's the part I need right there. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's been guys calling up there looking for the, what they want is a steering knuckle, but they're calling it a spindle or they're calling it a hub or something. Yeah. Oh, and I've worked on stuff for 30 years, and I can hear somebody telling me what they're trying to explain, and when I really can't quite picture it, I pull up that exploded view myself because I haven't worked on a 97 Ford in a long time. Now I've got them about memorized again yeah. just from going through the thing. <laughs> Exploded views, but uh, that kind of thing is is ex extremely helpful. And I've had a lot of praise on the phone for the, the website just for that sort of thing. That and all the information in the tech notes under the parts. And So the, the if we were to sum it all up and say, what is Torque King? I would say Torque King is your best possible 
your best chance. Best possible <laughs> chance of getting that thing back together, putting it back on the road. And not just from the parts that we have, but from the information to get the right parts from the people yes. who are trying to get the right parts. Yes, from it's always parts been... Parts that only we make anymore. Yes, it's always been an issue, uh, you know, everybody's heard somebody call a differential a pumpkin, you know, right. at some point. Well, or a front rear end. Or a front rear end, yeah, my front <laughs> rear pumpkin. Yeah, front, yeah. front rear pumpkin. Uh, that one um, just kills me. So, I mean, we've... We're putting as much effort into as we can, explosive views, product information. Um, you know, a lot of times people don't know what they have, but it's not necessarily their fault if they don't have a reference to go off of. Right. They just kind of assume, I've done it. I'm sure you've done it. Oh, yeah. Um, you can only know what you know until yeah. you know something different. Yeah. So we try to provide as much information as we can so that, you know, so that the customers are able to, you know, positively say yes. That is the part that I need. Absolutely. Uh, it's, there's nothing better than being able to say, I know exactly what you mean, and I have it. <laughs> I love that. You probably say that a lot. I do. I say it almost every day, multiple times a day. I do say it every day. I say it several times, almost every day. And and it's it's the, the clip that you talked about, the 40201, for the automatic hubs and the Ford Dana 60s. Oh, for, you, uh, forgot, you forgot yeah. about the number, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. That, that little clip, I get a call for that, and the guy will say, you know, I need this one little half. Moon. I said, you got a 96, 50, 96 F-250, don't you? He says, how did you know? Because I know. Because <laughs> this is the only place you can get that part. Mm -hmm. And so uh, real quick, we've got a, a good rapport with, with, with customers because we know what they're looking for, and I know the pain they're finding this only here so I know how it feels to, to go and search and search and search and you can't find it and then you finally find it and that guy's your hero mm -hmm. so glad that we can be that hero yes I love being the hero any chance we get absolutely I'll take it every chance mm -hmm. so I think that pretty much sums up what I wanted to know a little bit more about Torque King today I mean we've got more we could talk about any day but we're going to do this more than once so we'll mm -hmm. have a chance yeah as a um, uh, Anything you want to finish up with? Well, uh, I guess I just got a question for you. Um, what kind of things are you doing here? To I'm let doing, everybody know. I'm living the dream. And yeah. I know people hear that and they think it's a joke, but I am. I've been, uh, I've done a bunch of different things in my life. And being able to come here, uh, start out, starting out just packing orders in the warehouse, I just was looking for something to do because I was working at home on trucks and and cars and had kind of gotten to a stagnant point where I didn't have a whole lot of new business coming in. I really wasn't looking for a whole lot of new business, but I wanted to do something. And so when I came in and got that book for the NV4500 and and the salesman at the counter says, are you looking for a job? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I wasn't really looking for a job. They said, You'd probably come interview right now and they would probably hire you. <laughs> Uh, well, that's that's kind of funny, but I mean, I was talking about so many different things and, and talking about that transmission and all the different parts and trying to understand more about it. And so they were just kind of, they, they had an idea that maybe I knew a little more than more than the average Joe coming in. And so I came in and interviewed and, and started the next day. And that, I, I mean, I was glad to be here. I was just glad to have a job. Again, I haven't worked in a while. Didn't feel like working for a while after some personal tragedy and to come in here and then go from the warehouse into sales and learn about that uh, divorce case kit that you had mm -hmm. previously before the part became unavailable, uh, that kind of just sparked a fire. So drawing up that picture on the, on the counter was just something to do in between phone calls that maybe I could do something with it. And to take that and run with it the way you did, the way, the way your dad did, and and start training in 3D modeling and start working on 3D printing and all these things that I've wanted to do for a long, long time, uh, I didn't have the effort. I didn't have the option to do it at the time. I didn't have the, I didn't know where to start. And to be able to have it just handed to me so that I could do it here. More dumped fantastic. on your lap. 
Oh, no. That's not how I feel at all. Well, no, but that's kind of how quick it was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but uh, I was glad to have it. You, know, you couldn't do that to me if I didn't want it. And so being able to find uh, the next new need, the next new thing that we need to do, uh, along with the myriad of ideas that you've already got for producing parts, um, being able to draw them up quickly and print a part out to try it out and see what we can do, see is there really enough demand for this? Uh, it's exciting. It's exciting to be part of something like that um, and, and just making new stuff. I've wanted to make things forever. I've made some stuff on my own. I've made one-off pieces here and there, but to be able to produce something that might potentially help people all over the United States, all over North America, and all over the world, world really. Yeah, uh, that's an exciting thing. So I'm really glad to be part of that. Well, we're certainly glad to have you. You mm -hmm. bring a lot of expertise to the table. Well, thank there's, you. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of parts we're working on that are very close to production that probably wouldn't have happened if it wasn't uh, wasn't for you taking the time to draw them up for us. That was the right time at the right place. Yeah, yeah, that's no joke right there. So. We got more stuff coming up soon. We got uh, another version of a divorce case transfer case kit. Working on that, uh, getting closer to it. Pretty close with that actually. Uh, working on twenty-seven spline washers for the Ford, Ford Ranger. Yes, friend. yes. Um, yeah, there was a couple different variations of those, and uh, I've got to find uh, the rest of my examples. To finish them, you right. some for drawing, but yeah, um, Word Ranger stuff. God, we got a lot of stuff. We we got a whole list of stuff that's right in the middle of drawing right now. Uh, prototyping or three D printing was just going yesterday on yeah. uh, on some stuff. Working on those bushings. Hopefully, we'll have some bushings available. Uh, working on what was the other thing I was thinking about? Oh, those that seventy four to seventy nine Dodge front knuckle yeah. piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe coming up with a better solution for you guys out there with that 74 to 9 Dodge half ton, three quarter ton that has that basically a unit bearing. Yeah. Oddball. The, the live spindle. Thing. Yeah. We're working on something for that too. Uh, all kinds of stuff coming up. You'll have to stay tuned. Yeah, I think that's going to be pretty much it. Stay tuned. You don't know what's coming next. And if you got an idea for us, send it in. Give us a comment down below. Give us a like, give us a subscription, hit that notification bell, hear the next one that's coming out. And uh, we're very much glad to have you watching, and hope to see you again soon.